Uh, Lord, sometimes we read a passage like that and we wonder what it would have been like to be there and uh, to be there on the day of Pentecost and to see these amazing things happen and to hear your apostles speak on such a momentous occasion. Um, And I guess, Lord, that's fair enough, but um, you still speak. Your apostles still speak through the scriptures. And so we thank you that we can be here each Sunday and other times during the week and gather around your word and still hear you speak just the same as you spoke on those momentous days. And so, Lord, help me to rightly explain your scriptures on this occasion and please help all of us to listen carefully, closely, give us understanding. We're not naturally spiritual people. We need your assistance in this. So please be with us, we pray. Amen. Okay, on the next slide, I have a question for you uh, with your neighbours for the next 30 seconds. When you think of big moments in world history, what comes to mind? 30 seconds, big moments in world history, go. Okay, that was probably 30 seconds. I'm interested to know a couple of the things that that you came up with from from this little block of seats here, big moments in world history. Anyone want to be brave and call one out? The Magna Carta, thank you. 9-11, great. We won't won't, won't get too many. Uh, From the middle block here, big days in world history. The moon landing and... End of World War II, absolutely. Big days in history. This block over here. Uh, Genghis Khan. Khan. Yeah, he's a major figure in world history. True. Anyone else? Birth of Jesus. Oh, gold star for you, Stan. (laughs) I think that's great. Yes, big days in in world history. Excellent. Uh, This morning we're looking at Acts chapter 2, which is read for us, Day of Pentecost, and I think that also ought to be gold star kind of marked as one of those momentous days in world history. I'm going to try and kind of convince you of that as we go through uh, the passage. Uh, just to remind you, what we're about to launch into another uh, kind of series on the book of Acts. We've done that for a couple of years running. Um, and uh, as of next week, I think Murray's going to take us into chapter 16. But we've taken a couple of weeks, last week and this week, to look at chapters 1 and 2 and just kind of get ourselves back in the groove of Acts and, and remembering what's happening. Well, last week, uh, we saw the resurrected Jesus tell his apostles not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait, to wait there for the gift that had been promised, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that happen this morning in Acts chapter 2. Last week, we also saw a key verse in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. If you're the sort of person who highlights or underlines your Bible, I don't think that's sacrilegious at all. That's If that works for you to to lock uh, verses in your brain, that's good. Chapter 1, verse 8 talks about how the apostles' job is to take the gospel from Jerusalem and then Judea, Samaria, and then out to the ends of the earth. That's kind of the the, the pattern of the book of Acts, but it's also the pattern of world history that we are in right now, and we looked at that last week as well. As we come to Acts chapter 2, we get a, a long, you probably picked that up as Larissa read it, a long sermon from the apostle Peter. Uh, First half of Acts is kind of mainly about the Apostle Peter. Second half of Acts, mainly about the Apostle Paul. This is the first big message from Peter, and it's fairly long, fairly detailed. I want to work our way through it and try and make it as clear as possible uh, for all of us to understand. 
Uh, on the screen is coming up, if, if I was going to try and arrange kind of chronologically and logically for me, uh, the, the big events that are happening around this time, this is how I would put them. Jesus was raised from the dead. After that, we saw last week, he ascended and is seated at God's right hand. And from there, he sends the Holy Spirit. That's what's about to happen on the day of Pentecost. And because of that, we are now in the last days waiting for the day of the Lord. That's how I would arrange these events chronologically and logically. But Peter on the day, he is speaking to a whole crowd of Jewish people who up until this moment, they don't believe in Jesus. They're not part of the 120 Christians there in Jerusalem. The church is very small. It's just in the beginning days. The majority of those Jewish people that he's speaking to, yes, they know their Old Testament. Yes, they're waiting for the Messiah to come, but they don't think it's Jesus. For them, Jesus was some false Messiah, some criminal that was executed a couple of months ago. They either haven't heard that he rose from the dead, or if they've heard it, they probably don't believe it. They weren't there last week when he ascended into heaven, and so they've missed out on the first two of these big events. The first one that they really become aware of is the next one, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. So there's the arrow there. They're kind of coming in halfway through the story. And the reason they became aware that the Holy Spirit had been sent was when something very strange happened. Chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues, other languages, as the Spirit enabled them. Now, there were, staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it then that each of us hears them in our native language? And if you skip down to verse 13, some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. So Peter is addressing this crowd of Jewish people who do not so far accept the Lord Jesus, but they are astonished at this coming of the Spirit and this gift of tongues and what's happening. They know something momentous is happening. They want to know what it is. They've gathered. And so Peter does what good educators do. He starts with what they already know, and then he'll move into the parts that they don't know. He starts with the coming of the Holy Spirit there, the third one, but then as the talk goes on, as Peter's sermon goes on, he actually spends the bulk of the time talking about the Lord Jesus. You should stop and think about that for a moment. If there was ever a moment you might think to give a sermon that was all about the Holy Spirit, wouldn't the day of Pentecost be the one? The coming of the Spirit? That would be the great time for a sermon on the Spirit, wouldn't it? Peter starts talking about the Spirit, but then he actually spends the bulk of the time talking about Jesus. Why is that? Is he kind of ripping the spirit off somehow, not letting him have that moment in the limelight? No, because this thing that the Holy Spirit loves to do is to not be in the limelight, but to shine that spotlight on the Lord Jesus. The spirit brings people to Christ. And so Peter speaks exactly as the Holy Spirit wants him to speak, not focusing on the Holy Spirit, but focusing all the attention on Jesus. That's a message for us as well. Do you want to be a spirit-filled Christian? Good, then speak about Jesus. That's the mark of a spirit-filled Christian. That's what Peter does in this talk, and we're going to follow his order that he goes through. So again, on the screen here, he's going to start with the Holy Spirit and talk about the last days, and then he's going to go back and shine that spotlight on the Lord Jesus, raised from the dead, and ascended to God's right hand. So let's have a look at it in that order, Peter's order. First of all then, Jesus sent the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you're a Christian, maybe you've been a Christian for many years, you might assume that um, people in the Old Testament times had the Holy Spirit just as we do. 
because that's our experience now. If you're a Christian, you have the Spirit, you have God's presence with you and assistance. Uh, But it wasn't actually like that in Old Testament times. In Old Testament times, very few of God's people had God's Spirit dwelling within them. The prophets did, some of the kings, some of the priests, but your run-of-the-mill Old Testament Jewish believer did not have the Spirit. Of course, the Spirit was at work in their life, but not dwelling within them. Most ordinary people did not have the Holy Spirit, and yet there were Old Testament predictions, prophets that were looking ahead saying, you know, one day, one fantastic day, God's Spirit's going to be poured out. Not just here and there on an occasional person for an occasional task, but poured out on all of God's people. And the Spirit will live in all of God's people. And that's why this day, the day of Pentecost, is one of those landmark days in history. Like the end of World War II or the coming down of the Berlin Wall. In fact, more significant than any of those things. It's a huge event, the day that God pours out his Spirit on all of God's people. And Peter wants to talk about that. So chapter 2, verse 14, Peter stood up with the 11, raised his voice and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. This is the day long awaited for, that the prophets have spoken about, that people have been waiting for, and it's come, the day of Pentecost. Holy Spirit poured out. Jesus told them last week, don't leave Jerusalem until the gift is given. Now it's been given. These early Christians, the apostles and the others there with them, they're not drunk. They're filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives them a miraculous gift. He allows them to speak in human languages that they never knew, that they hadn't studied It's a miraculous gift, and they have that gift so that they can share with everybody in the crowd from all these different places, they can share Jesus. And I've often thought that gift of tongues, of being able to speak another language miraculously, that would be a pretty cool gift to receive, right? I would like that. Have you ever travelled to another country, maybe on a holiday or work or something like that, and they speak a different language there? Wouldn't that be great to get off the plane and just ding, you've got the language, you're ready to go. I think that would be fantastic. Uh, But the gift here is not uh, a cool party trick. It's not about convenience when traveling to some other place. This gift has a purpose. It's so that the apostles can share the good news of Jesus with people in their mother tongue. Because language matters. God loves people all over the planet, from every country, from every language. And if you're trying to communicate a message like the good news of Jesus, then language matters. I think most of you know uh, with Stu, I'm involved in uh, Christian Union and Focus, the ministry up there at Monash University. And the particular thing I've been tasked with is trying to bring the gospel to international students who don't come from every single country around the world, but a lot of them, and they're there. And you know how many languages I speak? One, like most Aussies, Uh, I do not have a particular gift of language. Now, that's okay as far as it goes because most of the students have come here to learn English and practice their English. They're happy with that. But I'm not particularly happy with that because what would be better is if I could reach them in their own language. And so it's wonderful. Like uh, uh, next year, we're going to have a new apprentice join the team. Her name's Annika, and her background is Chinese. She is fluent in Mandarin. That's her culture. That's her language. And she's going to be able to speak to those Chinese students in a way that I never could. Their English is okay. I can kind of get the message across, all right. But it's not the same, is it, as someone speaking your heart language. And so part of my job, actually, is to try and employ people who are better at my job than I am. And a big part of that is language and culture. 
The apostles here, no fear. They've got the fast track. They've got the, the miracle. They can suddenly speak the language. I wish I had that. I don't. That's what's happening. Gift of tongues so that the gospel can be spread. Second point. Now in the last days before the day of the Lord. Jesus has poured out the Holy Spirit on the early church and the significance of that is that they can communicate the gospel best as possible in the heart language of the audience. But it's also significant for another reason because this is a big day in history and it helps us to understand where we live in history. Not just, oh, I'm living after the Second World War. It helps us to understand where we live in biblical history, history seen from God's perspective. So let's listen to Joel's prophecy again, and I want you to notice two important times, the last days and the day of the Lord. The last days, day of the Lord. Have a look from verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to blackness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Did you see those two things? Last days, day of the Lord. If I was going to put that on a, on a graphic, on a timeline, it would be something like this. The last days are that entire period between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. That might strike you as a little bit weird. Surely the last days should just last for a few days, right? But no, in Bible language, the last days are lengthy. They're that entire time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. We have had 2,000 years of last days. And they will last until Jesus' second coming, which is also known as the day of the Lord. You are here. This is where you live in world history. You are part of the last days. And you are waiting for the day of the Lord. That is going to be a really momentous historical day. That will be the end of this period of history and the start of eternity. Another way of saying this is in terms of the Bible, there's only one big historical day yet to come. It's not the release of the iPhone 15, 16, 17, whatever. That's not the big thing we're waiting for. Only one day in history we're waiting for, the day of the Lord. And you need to understand the day of the Lord. For Christians, it's going to be a wonderful day. For everybody else, it's going to be a horrible day. Lots of the prophets talk about the day of the Lord. On the screen are two sample, representative kind of prophecies about the day of the Lord. One from Amos, one from Obadiah. Listen to how they speak about the day. Amos chapter 5, verse 18. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear, as though he entered his house and rested his hand on the wall only to have a snake bite him. Obadiah chapter 1 verse 15. The day of the Lord is near for all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your deeds will return upon your own head. This day is a scary day. It's a very scary day if you are a rebel against God. That's going to be a bad day for you. Is there any hope for rebels like you or rebels like me? Well, thankfully there is. Joel tells us in verse 21 of our passage, there it is. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How are we saved? Is it by being a really good and moral person? No. Listen to God's words. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord 
will be saved. That's how we're saved. We call out to Lord Jesus. So we know where we are in history. We live in the last days. We do not know how long they are going to last. One day, maybe soon, maybe not so soon. I'm not sure. We saw that last week. No one knows the day or the hour, but one day they're going to come crashing to a close with the day of the Lord. And that could be any moment. Make sure you are ready for that day. Let's see what Peter says next. Point three. Jesus was raised from the dead. He is the Messiah. Peter has explained to his Jewish audience that the Holy Spirit has been poured out, this great day that they've been waiting for. And he's explained to them that that means this is the last days. This is the day that you need to be saved because the day of the Lord is coming. The crowd need to call on the name of the Lord, but they don't know who the Lord is. They haven't accepted Jesus. And so Peter goes back to explain to them who Jesus is. Now, when you're telling a joke, you never like start with the punchline. That were to be get everything back to front. That would be no good. But Peter's sermon is lengthy. I'm going to just give you the punchline and then show you how he got there. Okay? Make it a bit clearer. Here's the punchline, verse 36. This is how he finishes his sermon. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. That's where Peter is going in his talk. He wants to convince the audience that Jesus has these two epic titles. He's Messiah. He is Lord. How does he prove that? Well, let's look at them each in turn. First of all, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God's chosen king. And to understand Peter's logic here, this is all you need to know. The one who rises from the dead, that's the Messiah. That's one of the predictions about what the Messiah will do. So listen to how Peter starts his talk in verse 22. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did, uh, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to a cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, and he's about to quote David, right? David lived a thousand years before Jesus. So this is a long-term prediction about the Messiah beforehand, thousand years BC, this is what David said. I saw the Lord always before me, and because he's at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope. Why? Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You've made known to be the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Now, if all you had was David's words, you would think, ah, David himself is not going to decay. David himself is going to rise from the dead. But then listen to what Peter says, verse 29. Fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day, but he was a prophet And he knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. You see Peter's logic. Peter's going back a 1,000 years saying, look at King David. David knew that one day one of his descendants would rise from the dead. That's going to be the Messiah. That's God's chosen king. And who's that? That's Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God's chosen king. And so to go back to our little uh, diagram here on the next slide, Jesus was raised from the dead. That means he is Messiah. That's the first epic title Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is King. Let's have a look at the second epic title. This one's a bit shorter. Jesus ascended to 
uh, at God's right hand, so he is the Lord. What you need to know for this one is that the person that God lets sit at his right hand, he's the Lord. He's the Lord. And once again, no surprises, that's Jesus. Here's Peter's argument from verse 33. Exalted to the right hand of God, he, Jesus, has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, the Lord, that's God, said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, here's his punchline, therefore let all Israel be assured of this, God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Messiah. The fact that Jesus has ascended to heaven and is seated at God's right hand means, next slide, he is Lord. He's raised from the dead, he's the Messiah, he's ascended at God's right hand, he's Lord. That's who Jesus is. And the Jewish people, the audience who Peter's talking to, they have got Jesus badly wrong, haven't they? Badly wrong. Jesus is Messiah. Jesus is Lord. But the Jewish people, they went, he's, he, he's nobody. He's unimportant. He's a false Messiah. We don't care about him. In fact, you know what? Let's have him killed. Let's have him crucified as a criminal. They have badly got Jesus wrong. Years ago, many years ago now, when I was at university myself, I remember a particular day. I'd finished up my studies and I was walking home and I walked through uh, like a, a Westfield, like a shopping mall. Uh, and as I walked through, I remember two policemen coming my way. And you know when you're driving your car and you see the police car coming or if you're walking and policemen or women are walking towards you, uh, hopefully your thought is, Oh, well, this is going to be fine. I haven't done anything wrong. Uh, they're just going to pass me by and I will go about my business. That's exactly how I felt on this day. Walking through the shopping centre, two policemen coming towards me and I waited for them to pass me. They did not pass me. They walked straight up to me and even worse, they said, hello, Dan. And I thought, ooh, no. Uh, I said, hello. And they said, what you doing? And I went, um... I'm just heading home from university. And they went, oh, really? University? Oh, oh, very interesting. What's in your backpack? I went, um, textbooks. And they went, oh, they looked at one another. Oh, textbooks, textbooks, is it? Oh, right. You wouldn't mind opening your backpack and showing us these textbooks, would you? And I went, um, yeah, okay. And so I got my backpack down and I opened it up and they looked in and they went, oh, it is textbooks. And I went, yeah, like, I'm coming from university. And they went, oh. Now, I don't remember the surname, but it was something like this. They went, are you Dan Baker? And I went, no, no, I'm Dan King. And they went, oh, sorry, sorry. There's this other guy named Dan. Looks exactly like your spitting image, well known in these parts for doing break and enters and robbing people. And there was a robbery about half an hour ago. We saw you. We thought you were him. We thought this must be the guy. Sorry, complete mistake. Got you wrong. Off you go. And I thought to myself, wonderful. There's a guy out there doing crimes who not only looks like me, but has the name Dan. That's just brilliant. The police got me completely wrong. Do you know what happens when someone gets Dan King wrong? Nothing actually happens. I'm a bit of a nobody. Uh, I just went home and thought maybe one day that'll be a cool story for a sermon. Um, you get Dan King wrong, nothing happens. No big deal. You get Jesus wrong, big problem, big, big problem. And that's what this Jewish audience have done. The one who God loves, who is precious to him, who God has chosen to be the Messiah, the King, the Lord, they've trashed him, they've rubbished him. They said, this guy's no good, he's hopeless, we, we wish he was dead. And in fact, we made that happen. We got the Romans to string him up on a cross. You get Jesus wrong, you're in big problem, big trouble. And suddenly this audience realises it. Because of Peter's sermon and the points he's gone through, suddenly it's crystal clear. Suddenly it's all laid out in black and white. 
a little bit like yesterday's grand final. That joke doesn't work. Suddenly they see it crystal clear. They see Jesus for who he is for the first time and they realise we have got God's chosen one badly wrong. And they're cut to the heart, verse 37. If we've got God's chosen one, God's own son, this badly wrong, and we had him killed, like, is there any hope? Is there any, like, some mistakes you can recover from. Other mistakes are fatal. Which one is this? It, it, it feels pretty fatal. And so verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said to Peter and the other apostles, like, hear the desperation here, brothers, brothers, what should we do? What can we do? Is there any hope for us? Amazingly, there is, verse 38. Peter replied, repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted the message were baptised and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. There is hope. Even for these people who got Jesus so wrong, there is hope. Peter tells them how they have to respond. They have to do two things. They have to repent. They have to get baptised, baptised in water. And if they do those two things, they will receive two blessings. Their sins will be forgiven, even the sin of getting Jesus wrong and having him strung up on a cross and executing him as if he was a criminal. Even that sin can be forgiven and also they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that is in the apostles as they're preaching all this in different languages. Now, I want to be super clear here. What will save these people who got Jesus so wrong? Is it their repentance? Does that save them? Is it the baptism in water? Does that save them? No. The only thing that can save us is the Lord Jesus, right? He is the one who died on the cross and took the punishment for our sins. He is the one who rose from the dead and so gives us the promise that we too can put our old life behind us and live a new life from now on. It's Jesus who saves. Repentance and baptism, they don't save. Those things are the correct response to what Christ has done. They are the correct response. Because if you've been sinning, if you've been a rebel, if you've pushed God to the side and said, I don't care about you, I'm going to do my own thing, and then you learn that Jesus died for this sinful life, well, a correct response is to say, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to repent and I'm going to start going God's way instead. And another correct response, when you hear that Jesus died for your sins and then rose from the dead so that you could live a new life, the perfect response is to get baptised. And so to say publicly to everybody, I'm following Jesus now. I'm one of his. And as you go under the water, you're saying that old life, poof, dead, gone, not doing that anymore. And as you come up, psh, new life, fresh start. I'm going to live Jesus' way from now on. That's how they had to respond on that day. They had to repent they had to be baptised and 3,000 were. Amazing. Imagine being in a church of 120 people and after that sermon, hey, we're over 3,000 now. Be a few logistical problems to iron out there. That's how they had to respond. How should we respond these days, these last days, the year 2023? Well, it kind of depends who you are. Some of you I know would not call yourself a Christian right now. No, you're not a Christian. Jesus is not your number one. He's not the centre of your life. He's not your Lord. Uh, what I want to say to you, partly I want to say far out, if that's you and you're here, you're coming to church, you're hanging out with Christians, you're singing songs and reading Bible and listening to lengthy sermons, thumbs up, good on you. That's exactly the right thing to be doing. But I also want to say don't just stop there. 
Don't just come and join and hang out and listen for a bit and then walk out exactly the same. The day of the Lord's coming. It's real. You will be there one day and it's either going to be your best day or your worst day. I don't know if you think your life is going fine thus far. It's not. My life isn't. Your life is not. By nature, we are rebels. We dishonour God. We put ourselves on the pedestal, not God. We have friends, we have family, yes, but often they are people that we gather around ourselves to make us feel good and get through life okay. We are profoundly self-centred. Perhaps you know that. Perhaps you're well aware of your sin, of your shortcomings, of your mistakes. In fact, perhaps you're thinking, Dan, I have done something so bad. I'm I'm not even sure I can take it to God. I'm not even sure this can be forgiven. Friend, if that's you, think again. These people in the original audience, they killed God's son. And there was still hope of forgiveness and a fresh start. So whatever you've done, I don't think you've done that. Don't feel like what I've done is so bad I could never come back to God. You can. And I want to beg you to do that. Come back and find that forgiveness. Find that fresh start. It's there. Jesus has made it possible. So if that's you, how should you respond? Friend, you should do the same two things. You should repent. You should stop going your way and decide to go God's way. And you should be baptised. We're a Baptist church. We hold baptisms from every, every now and then. Sunday, 29th of October, four weeks from now, we've got a baptism service. If that's you and this is a, a whole new thing, I know the pastors, Murray, Mike, would love to chat to you about that. Or if you've been a Christian for a while but still haven't taken that step of being publicly baptised, that would be a great thing to do. Chat to Murray, chat to Mike. Repent, be baptised. And you know what? You take those steps, you will receive the same two blessings that I mentioned here in this passage. Your sins will be forgiven. You will receive the Holy Spirit, God's presence with you to help you live that new life. It is a wonderful blessing. I said the way we respond depends kind of on who we are. I've spoken to people here who are not Christian at the moment, but I'm really praying you would be. What about if you are a Christian? I take it that's the bulk of you guys in the service. What if we're already Christian? Well, first of all, make sure you're trusting in Jesus, yeah? Getting born in a Christian family, that's not going to save you. That's nice, that's a blessing, but that's not going to save. Going to a Christian school is not going to save you. Being a member, Mentone Baptist Church, good, that's a good thing to do. That's not going to save you. Bang Ten Commandments, that's not going to save you. Only Jesus can save you. So make sure you've responded to him. Make sure you're trusting in him. And if you've already done that, as I believe most of you have, then I want to encourage you to live appropriately to the time in history in which we find ourselves. I want to encourage you to live appropriately to the last days with the day of the Lord coming. In all society, how many people in Melbourne? What is it? Six million, seven million? I don't know. All those people. There are few who know that these are the last days. There are few who know that the day of the Lord is coming. There are few who know that the Lord Jesus is the only way to be safe on that day. You are among that few. You've got the inside scoop. So whatever else you do these last days, and you're going to have many responsibilities, lots of things that you have to do, but whatever else you do, helping people meet Jesus has got to be central, yeah, important. A big piece of the puzzle of your life, my life. Does that mean that we should all quit our day job and just give ourselves fully to gospeling and Bibling and evangelizing? No, not necessarily. Some of you are going to be gifted to do that, and you probably should do that. You probably should pull out of your career, go to Bible college, get trained, and make that your thing. But for most Christians, no, that's probably not the thing. But even if you're not particularly gifted to do that, that doesn't mean you're second-class Christian or you don't have any role to play or you're somehow kind of lesser. No. Each one of us have the same job. Each one of us have been in particular gifts and skills and abilities and backgrounds and languages and whatever it is 
We are each going to have our part to play in seeing the good news go out. You have gifts. You will have a role to play. Together, as a family, a Christian family, we are bringing the gospel to the nations at the ends of the earth. There are no superstars. There's no class A and class B. We're all doing this together as a team. So the quiet person who invites their friends over coffee to come and check out small group or the church service is similar to the person who operates the slides during the service so that the message is clear. And that's similar to the person who bakes for morning tea so that people can gather around after the service and enjoy a cuppa and have something nice to eat while you have those significant conversations after the service. And that's similar to the person who's sitting in the chair while the message is being preached and they're praying and they're praying and they're praying that Christians will be built up and people who aren't Christians yet will be convicted and brought to the Lord Jesus. And that's similar to the musicians who have skills that I know nothing about, but they're great at it. And they play songs and they sing the words and they help us to reflect on all that we've learnt. And then there's someone at the microphone who's teaching God's words. We've all got our role to play. None better, none worse, all working together as a team. So work out where your personality, where your gifts can play that role in these last days. That's our task. That's the big task, to take the gospel out to the ends of the earth. And we're going to do it. And you know what? We're going to see fruit. God saved 3,000 on that day. I don't know if it's going to be 3,000 in our midst. It might be. But even if it's one, that's significant. That's a life saved. That's a life turned around and giving Jesus the honour. That's a good day. So let's do this ministry in these last days expectantly because the day of the Lord's coming and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and God's got people prepared. There are people who will respond when we as a church take the good news out. So prayerfully, look for those opportunities. Take those opportunities. Use your time in these last days well. I'm going to pray that we do that. Dear Lord Jesus, we want to give you all the honour, all the glory, all the praise. We confess in line with scripture that you are Messiah. You are the chosen king. And also that you are the Lord. You are the one who has saved us. You are the one who sends the Holy Spirit to us. We got you so wrong in the past. But we thank you that when we listen to what you say in scripture, we can see you as you really are. Lord, I pray for each of us in this building that we will treat you right, that we will make sure that you are our Messiah and our Lord. And I also, Lord, pray for those of us who are already following the Lord Jesus, that you'll help us to prioritise our time in these last days right. There's many things we have to do, Lord, and we confess we are prone to being distracted. Please help us to be focused and use the time you've given us well. We pray this for your glory. Amen.